Good morning, New Destiny. Good morning, New Destiny. Those of you who are in the house and those of you who are online, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. I'm so glad that this morning at our 930 huddle that Reverend Corey shared such an awesome story, an illustration rather, about our perspective and how we choose to see things. It's so easy to just agree with the negative. It's agree to get caught up in all the bad things that are going on, going on in the world. But we serve a God who is true and living and alive. He is the risen Savior on today. And because he lives, the old song says, I can face tomorrow. Amen. So we thank God that we have an in spite of praise. That in spite of what's going on in our lives, we can still lift up our hands and say, hallelujah. That in spite of the sickness we might be experiencing in our body, we can still say, Lord, you're a healer. In spite of the bad thoughts that might come into our mind, we say, Lord, we surrender those thoughts over to you because we know that you are a mind regulator. So no matter what's going on in your life, you have the opportunity today to just thank God. We just have the opportunity today to say, God, I trust you. I lean not to my own understanding, God, but in all my ways, Father, I will acknowledge you and you will direct my path. Amen. Is that anybody's testimony on today? That when you didn't know what to do, that when you leaned on the Father, he showed you which way to go. When you wanted to go left, he said go right. When you wanted to leave it, he said stay. When you wanted to give up and he said don't quit. When you wanted to turn around and he said kept going, that's the kind of God that we serve on today. And for that, I'm thankful. Oh, I'm grateful that we serve a God who looks beyond our faults and sees our needs. I'm thankful for a God that did take his hand off of us when we were too tired to press on, amen. I'm thankful for a God that forgives us even when we have not forgiven ourselves, amen. So I just want to encourage you on today. Cast those cares over unto the Lord because he cares for you. He will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is staying on him because we trust in him, amen. That's the kind of God we serve. Let us go before the throne in prayer on this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name, God. Righteous is your name, God. Mighty is your name, Father God. Your kingdom come, God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father God, we are gathered here today, God, just to say that we love you, God. We love you, Father God, even in the times when things are going the way we're going to, God. We trust you enough to say that, God, we know that you are in control, Father, and we pray that your will be done, not our will, God, because your ways are higher than our ways, God. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, God. And we just thank you, Father God, that we don't have to carry the burden, God, of making decisions day in and day out, God. But if we seek you first, God, your kingdom and your righteousness, God, you will add all these things unto us, Father. So we thank you, God. Hallelujah, Father, that even though we might have come into the doors feeling heavy and weighed down, God, we can cast those cares onto you, Father. You are the burden bearer, God. You are the heavy load sharer, God. You are the way maker, God. You are the bridge over troubled water, God. You are the way when it seems no way, God. You are the light in the darkness, Father. You are a mother to the motherless, God. You are a father to the fatherless, God. You are a friend to the friendless, Jesus. Oh, I thank you, God. Hallelujah. That whatever we need you to be, God, that is what you are, God. We thank you, God, that you sit high and you look low, God. And we thank you now, God, that on today that you're inclining your ear, God, to hear the prayers of your people, God. You said that it only takes two of us to agree, God, and we are overstrict in this place, God. So we declare, God, that you will answer prayers on today, God. We declare, God, that you will set free on today, God. We declare, God, that you will come into this place. Have your way, God. Move from heart to heart and from breast to breast, God. Ease the burden, God. Lighten the pain, God. Heal the sickness, Father God. Turn the situation around, God. Make a way of escape, God. Provide the funds, God. Provide what is needed, Father, in this name of Jesus, God. And I just thank you, Father. God, we come to you, God, on one accord, God, asking you to come into this place, God. Asking that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. We want to experience you in a way that we've never experienced you before, God. Come into this place, God. Touch every heart, God. Mend every broken heart, God. Massage all the necks that have been stiffened, God. Change the hearts of stone into a heart of flesh, God. Let there be nothing that hinders us from receiving your very best on today, God. We stand in expectation, God.
moment of a mighty move from you, Father. Come in like a mighty rushing wind, oh God. Breathe a new life into this place, God. Revive us again, oh God. Hallelujah. Bring us back into fellowship with you, Father. That is our desire on today, God. And we know, Father, that you can and you will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, God. So we submit this service into your hand, God. And we just say, have your way, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. And also, have your way, Jesus. Glory to your name, Father. We love you, God. Be glorified on today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, 
Come on and give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, he's been good to you. Come on, y'all sitting around like he ain't did nothing. I see people clapping their hands, which means you have the use of your lips. I see that people are speaking, which means you have the use of praise God. So I need everybody in the room just for 10 seconds to think about the goodness of Jesus and all the things that he's done for you. Every door that he opened, every way that he's made, every night that he's kept you, every day that he's held you, praise God. So glad that he taught you and me. All right. And oh, how he tells me that I am your own, my Lord. Can I say it one more time? Said he knows my name. So glad that he knows my name. All right. Said he knows my name. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that he knows my name. All right. And oh, how he walks with me. Everybody say, you know my name, say. Talk to you, yeah. And oh, how you talk with me. Oh, how he tells me. Oh, how you tell me. That I am his own. I am own. Come on, everybody all over the middle. Let's raise it up. Say, so you know my name, say.
right here, everybody right here. Say, oh, how he, oh, how he walks with me. Oh, said he talks with me. Oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells, oh, how he tells me that I am his friend. Say, Give it to him right there. Come on, let's bless his name right here. Come on and give it to him right here. The fact that he knows my name today. The fact that he knows my name. I don't have to be afraid of the enemy. He said, I'm so glad that he knows my name. So glad that he knows my name. So glad that he knows my name. Give God some glory in here. So grateful. So grateful for a God that knows my name. I don't care if I walk into a room and no one ever calls my name out loud. The only person who needs to know my name is God. As long as he knows my name, I think I'm going to be okay. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me into the New Testament, the uh, book of Acts. Acts 28, verses 1 through 6. Again, that's the book of Acts. Acts 28, verses 1 through 6. Very familiar passages of Scripture, but God is going to give us some new revelation through it this morning. Amen. Again, New Testament, the book of Acts, chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the, the NIV, the New International Version. We find these words. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, a snake, was driven out by the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice 
has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire, and he suffered no ill effects. Lord, have mercy. And the people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. I want to talk to you this morning using the subject of you will survive it. You will survive it. Let's pray. God, we thank you. God, we praise you. God, we thank you. Give you honor, glory, and praise for today, oh God. This is the day that you have made us, oh God. We take time now to rejoice and be glad in it, Father God. God, we thank you for the prayers that have been prayed, oh God. The songs that have been sang this morning, oh God. And now, God, it's come time for the preach word. God, we pray that you will continue to show yourself strong and mighty. God, hide me behind thy consecrated cross, oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, O oh God, be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. For, Lord, you are your rock, and you are my rock and my redeemer. Holy Spirit, have your way. Do what you want to do and say what you want to say. This we pray your son's Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You will survive it. Tell somebody, I will survive this. How many of us can look back over our lives and realize that it is only by the grace of God that we have made it this far. I know I sure can uh, because there was a time in my life when I was young, dumb, and crazy. And then I was old, dumb, and crazy. Sometimes I've been just dumb and sometimes I've been just crazy. But God's grace has covered me and carried me through it all. And just like me, somebody in this place this morning can testify that it had it not been for the Lord on your side, uh, that you would have died in that car wreck, uh, that you may have died in that hospital bed, uh, that you may be spending your life behind prison walls, uh, but yet and still, here you sit today. Uh, and our testimony is God blocked it and he wouldn't let it be so. And see, those are just the things that we know about, right? Think about the things that God never allowed uh, to come your way. The accident you avoided by running just a few minutes late that day. The terminal sickness that was found and, and, and avoided because the doctors caught it early. The gunshot you missed because you decided to stay home and, and not go to the club that night. Uh, it's easy to shout about uh, the things that we see, but what about those things uh, that we never see that God God never allows to come our way. You see, whether seen or unseen, known or unknown, the known or unknown, the fact of the matter is you have survived every attack by the enemy that's been on your life. And the evidence that you have survived is because you are sitting here today. And because you have survived every past attack, uh, whatever you are going through right now, whatever is waiting for you just around the corner, corner, God will have me to tell you today that you will survive it. Somebody say, I'm a survivor. You see, we should never lose sight of the fact that by virtue of being a follower of Christ, we have an automatic target on our back uh, because the mission of the enemy is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Uh, and because you belong to God, uh, that makes you one of his primary targets. Uh, but also because you belong to God, uh, you know that you've got God's hand of protection on you at all times. Uh, but you also have to realize that some of the toughest things that you go through are God allowed and God ordained. That they are a part of a greater plan and a greater purpose. The difference is, see, you have to know the difference. The difference is that when it comes from God, it's a trial. But when it comes from the enemy, it's an attack. And now listen, I realize that God allowed and God ordained trials can be just as painful as an attack from the enemy uh, because while you are in the midst of it, you can't tell the who, the what, or the why it's happening. Uh. See, let's just be honest. Pain is pain uh, regardless of who's behind the pain. Uh. Whether I lost my job because the enemy is trying to attack my livelihood or if I lost my job because God is doing it to elevate me to something higher, the net result is that I am without a source of income. And in the end, I may understand it better by and by, 
uh, but why I'm in it, all I understand is I ain't got no job and it don't feel real good right now. But either way, since you are a child of God, what you do know is that you will survive it. Uh, and how do I know this? Uh, because God has a proven track record. Uh, and if God has done it before, then surely God uh, will do it again. Uh, anybody here this morning can testify that I've seen God do it over and over and over again. I've been sick, but I survived. I've been broke, but I survived. I've been depressed, but I survived. I've been at rock bottom, but I've survived. For every situation I've ever found myself in, God has been faithful and God has brought me out. Paul, who is the central figure in this text, uh, he endured many attacks uh, in his pursuit to deliver the gospel. And yet he persisted as a faithful witness uh, to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Uh, from the day he met Jesus on that Damascus road until his death, uh, he spread the good news uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, he spent years in prison uh, where he would continue to testify about the goodness of God uh, even while he was in bondage. But what I can't understand uh, is that as free men and free women, uh, some of us find it hard to freely and openly tell somebody about how good uh, God has been in our own lives. Uh, in this day and age, we have so many opportunities and avenues, uh, but we still just won't do it. We have all this social media. We got Facebook. We got Instagram. We got Twitter. Now we got something called Threads, uh, and we'd rather post our Sunday menu uh, and post our mess uh, rather than post something about the goodness of God. And by the way, uh, just in case you didn't know it, uh, God does not respond to your post. Uh, God responds to your prayers. Amen? So if you have a problem, get up off of social media and get down on your knees uh, and take it to the Lord in prayer. T to understand... Uh, the fullness of this text, I need to run through and give you a synopsis of the chapters leading up to chapter 28. You see, Paul's journey started in Rome, and Jerusalem started into Rome, sorry, started in Jerusalem, where he was arrested for spreading the gospel. He was on trial before the Sanhedrin Council, and the Sanhedrin Council was made up of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were the common working class. These folks cared more about religion religious practices and the law. The Sadducees uh, were the wealthy aristocrats, and these folks uh, were more concerned about politics uh, than religion. Neither side uh, was really a true representation uh, for the things of God. Uh, but that didn't stop Paul. Uh, Paul stood before this court, and he professed his faith in Jesus Christ, which caused a great uproar and divide among the council. And Paul was ordered to be taken into seclusion because they feared he would be killed. In other words, he was taken to protective custody. You see, God will provide provision and protection when you are bold enough to stand for him. Paul was aware of the setting he was in. He knew what these people represented. Yet and still, he held firm to what he believed. Paul said, I don't care that half of you care about politics. I don't care that half of you care about religious rituals. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've got to tell it where." Whenever I go, whenever I go, uh, and whoever I am in front of. And that's how we've got to be, uh, to never be ashamed or afraid to confess our faith, no matter who, what, when, where, or why. Whether you are in the presence of the Pope or in the presence of a pimp, you've got to be willing to profess that God is. God is. That God is what? God is Alpha and Omega. God is the beginning and the end. God is the lily of the valley. God is the bright and morning star. God is the wheel in the middle of the wheel. God is my everything. So I don't care who you come across. You got to be willing to say that God is. 
And so Paul is locked up, and, and the Lord appears to him and says, even though uh, you are in captivity, don't worry, be of good cheer. Now, that may sound strange because he's sitting in jail, and, and God has said to him, don't worry, man, uh, you're in jail, uh, be of good cheer. He told him that you testified about me in Jerusalem, but you also got to tell the word about me in Rome. And so in that, God was saying two things to Paul. The first thing God was telling Paul is, because you are willing to speak for me, uh, even when it's unpopular, I know that I can trust you, uh, and because I can trust you, I will use you. You've got to be willing to speak Jesus anytime, uh, any place. Uh, you ever wonder why, I wonder how uh, some people get able to get into certain rooms uh, and sit uh, at certain tables? Uh, it's because God knows uh, he can trust them uh, to to always represent him, uh, <clears throat> that they won't let uh, who they, where they are or who they are with represent how, affect how they represent him, that they won't go in their code switching. Y'all know what code switching is, right? Code switching is when someone acts or presents, presents themselves differently based on who they're around. For example, uh, there's the work me, uh, there's the church me, and then there's the, the me me. Uh, you see, the work me may be more buttoned up and, and pulled together. I use a, a certain dialect, and uh, my subject always matches my verbs, and my voice may even take on a, a different tone. Uh, that's, that's the work me. Uh, and then there's the church me. The church me may use all the spiritual jargon and hit you with the, some scripture, you know, I'm getting a little weary, but the Bible says that they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. That, that's the church me. And then there's the me me. The real me. My subject and verb don't have to agree. My Camilla Contra accent get to flowing. And I may use a few words or phrases that y'all church folks can't handle. That's me now. I'm talking about me. That's me. That's the me, me. I know y'all are holy all the time, and y'all speak holy all the time. But, uh, but the me, me sometimes uh, have to use some words uh, to make some points uh, that y'all might not agree with. That, that, that's the me, me. But you know what's so good? Is that the older I've gotten the, and the freer I've gotten in Christ... All three of these me's can show up in any setting at the same time. Because what I realize that all three of these me are the me me. I'm pulled up and proper. I'm saved and sanctified. And I'm country with a hint of, with a hint of hood. And so you're going to get all three of these me's because I do not have the time nor do I have the desire to try and put on and be something I'm not to try and please anyone else. So in the workplace, in one sentence you may get the, the work me, but in the next sentence you may get the me me. And they, they all run together. Because they all are me, and I shouldn't have to cold switch or pretend to be who I am to please anyone. If you can't accept me for me, that's your problem, not mine. But when you make yourself willingly available to be used by God, he will take you places uh, that you would never have imagined because he knows you, he can trust you to represent him at all times. The second thing that God was saying to Paul is he was telling Paul that your bondage is not a permanent place. That's real good right there. That your bondage is not a permanent place. God told Paul, cheer up because you won't be here for long. That the place you are in now is not where you will remain. You cannot stay here because of my assignment for you. And that's confirmation for somebody here today, somebody watching today. God says, because of the plans that he has for your life, that you can't stay in that place that you're in. What place are you referring to, Rev? I'm referring to that place of disparity, that place of depression. 
depression, uh, that place of doubt, uh, that place of dejection, uh, as impossible as it may seem, uh, God will bring you out from where you are to fulfill the purpose and the promise that he has for your life uh, because you have an assignment uh, and your assignment is greater than your adversity. Your assignment is greater than your adversary. Uh, your assignment is greater than your attacks, uh, your attacks uh, because in your assignment is where you will find your anointing. A lot of times people try to run away from their assignment. God calls them to do a certain thing or go a certain place or say a certain thing, but they don't want to do it. No, God, not me. No, God, I'm not ready. But when that is your assignment, uh, the anointing is in the assignment. Uh, and when you go where God says go uh, and you do what God says do, uh, God will make sure that you have everything you need uh, to carry out the assignment. So stop running from uh, your assignment. So the king orders Paul to, to be sent to Rome and to stand before Caesar. And Paul and, and the other prisoners are, are on a ship uh, trying to get to Rome. Uh, and a great storm arises. Uh, and everyone on the ship is afraid uh, that they are going to die in the storm. Uh, everyone uh, except Paul. Uh, Paul was not afraid uh, because he knew what God had already told him. Uh, Paul knew uh, that he had to get to his destination uh, because God is not a man. Uh, that he should lie. And if Paul, God told Paul uh, that he was going to Rome, uh, Paul said, come what may, uh, come low tide or high water, uh, I'm going to get to Rome uh, because God said so. When God makes you a promise, uh, he has to fulfill it uh, as long as we are willing uh, to do our part. Uh, he may not tell you how he's going to do it. Uh, he may not tell you when he's going to do it. Uh, he may not tell you everything uh, that you will go to have to go through uh, in order for him to do it. Uh, but one thing for sure is if God said he's going to do something, uh, you can rest assured that he's going to do it. Uh, so if you find yourself wondering uh, when God, uh, where God, uh, how God, uh, just keep on doing your part uh, and know that God is going to deliver on his promise. But in the midst of the storm, the Lord sent an angel to Paul on the boat to tell him, uh, the ship will be destroyed, but you will not. And in that, I see three things. The first thing uh, I see is that sometimes uh, how things look won't always match up to what God said. God told Paul uh, that he was witness in Rome. He's now on his way to Rome, but it looks like uh, he's about to die uh, in this storm. But God's so gracious uh, and God's so kind uh, that sometimes he will send a gentle reminder to you uh, to let you know of the promise. It was way back uh, in chapter 23 uh, that God told Paul uh, that he would witness in Rome. Uh, but it's not until chapter 27, uh, four chapters later, that they are now on this boat heading to Rome. Uh, and when it looked like things were not lining up uh, to the promise, God sent an angel to reassure Paul uh, that he indeed would survive. Uh, for most of us in our humanness, uh, this will cause us to worry and to question God uh, because what we're going through through, uh, does not look like uh, what God said. Uh, but God will send a reminder uh, to encourage us to, to hold on uh, just a little while longer uh, that the promise is coming. Uh, and sometimes uh, the promise may take four chapters. Uh, sometimes the promise may take uh, four years. Uh, sometimes the promise may take four decades. Uh, but if you keep on uh, holding on, uh, if you keep on trusting, uh, and if you keep on believing in God, uh, God will sin, uh, the promise. Uh, I always like to say, uh, I don't care what it looks like. Uh, I don't care what it sounds like. Uh, I don't care what it smells like or tastes like. Uh, whatever God says, uh, you never doubt it. Uh, don't trust how you feel. You got to trust what God says. Then the second thing that I saw in that, uh, God is saying, uh, what you are traveling in might not be fit for the journey. God destroyed the ship, but he saved the cargo. 
sometimes God has to wreck what's carrying you uh, to get you to the destination. Uh, that dysfunctioning that, that you're traveling in, uh, that situation uh, that you're traveling in, uh, that crowd uh, that you're traveling in, uh, they may not be fit for the place uh, that God is taking you. So sometimes uh, God has to destroy the vessel, uh, but he will save uh, the cargo. Uh, you ever wonder why certain people stop hanging around, stop coming around, they just stop calling out the blue, uh, they stop texting out the blue, uh, they stop coming by out the blue. Uh, you wonder why sometimes uh, you just have this desire to no longer engage in things uh, that used to bring you pleasure. Yeah, that's, that's, that's God destroying the vessel to save the cargo. But can I tell you this? Uh, stop trying to save uh, what God is purposely trying uh, to destroy. Stop trying to save what God is, God is purposely trying to destroy. Sometimes people drop out of our lives, but we try to pull them back in. Sometimes we lose the taste to, to drink alcohol or light up one every now and then, but we still try to, to force the issue. We still try to have a little drink every now and then. We still try to burn a little tree every now and then. Stop trying to save what God is trying to destroy because God is trying to destroy it on purpose. You don't need it. You don't need them. And sometimes, well not sometimes, God always has the foresight to see what you need and to see what you don't need. But, but we're so in our flesh sometimes uh, that when God says no, we're like, but God, I don't know. That's, that's my boy. That's, that's my girl. We've been running together for 25 years. Don't let a 25-year relationship stop you from what God has for you. And the third thing I see is that who you are connected to matters. You see, not only did God spare Paul, he spared everybody that was on the boat. He spared everybody who was connected to the promise. Uh, at one point, some of the men tried to, to jump off the ship and, and get on a lifeboat and get away. And Paul said to them, if any man leaves this ship, then surely he would die. That's why you've got to make sure you are connected to the right people. That's why I'm so glad that I'm connected to this church, that I'm connected to this pastor, that I'm connected to all of you, the people of God, because when you win, I I win. When you prosper, I prosper. When you're blessed, I'm blessed. When there is a blessing in the atmosphere, I know it's only a matter of time before it makes its way to me. And because of my connection, because of our connection, I believe that more new businesses will be open, that more better paying jobs are to come, that there will be new houses, that will be new cars, that will be land that is given to you that you didn't even see coming. And it's because of the connection. Having the right connection might just save your life. And so they were in the storm, being tossed and torn. The boat breaks apart, and now they are washed ashore by the storm. And all those aboard on the ship made it safely to shore because they were connected to the promise. And here we find ourselves uh, in Acts 28. There was shipwrecked on an island called Malta, and that name Malta has uh, two translations. Uh, the Canaanite translation means refuge, uh, and the Greek translation means sweet honey. Uh, so after being tossed and torn at sea, they landed in Malta, a place of sweet refuge. Uh, isn't it comforting to know uh, that after being in a storm, uh, that God will give you uh, a place of sweet refuge, uh, a place uh, that he can love on you, uh, a place that he can, uh, can care for you and, and put you back together if there's been any brokenness that you have experienced uh, while in the storm. Uh, listen, if you don't know nothing else today, uh, you need to know that God cares for you and, and that God wants the best for you. Uh, but even in doing so, sometimes uh, he has to take you through some rough places. Uh, and through those, and even though uh, he will take you through those rough places, uh, he will never 
never leave you there. Uh, and that when he brings you out, uh, he will bring you to a place of sweet refuge. And so in verse 2 says, uh, the islanders showed unusual kindness. They, they built the fire and they welcomed us because it was cold and rainy. Unusual kindness. I found that to be a very interesting phrase to use here. Uh, I checked several translations, and many of them use that same phrase, unusual kindness. Some even said extraordinary kindness. Uh, why was it their kindness was seen as unusual? Another translation said they called the people their barbarians. Not so much that they were uncivilized savages, but because they were non-Greek and non-Romans, and because of this, uh, Paul and the crew did not know what to expect from them. Uh, and when they greeted them with such kindness, uh, they were surprised and thought it unusual. It's funny to me uh, how we tend to categorize and, and stereotype people who are not like us. Uh, because you grew up here, uh, then you must be like that. Uh, because you dress like this, uh, then you must be like that. And so I asked the question, who's to say that you are the standard? Did God come along and tell you that you are the standard? And that everything and everyone should be measured up to. But I love how God took those same folks to teach us a lesson. Uh, they probably expected to have been have a rough time uh, with the natives, but instead God used them uh, to continue to provide uh, provision for them. You see, you never know who God has in place uh, to bless you. So stop dismissing folks uh, who are like you. Uh, stop prejudging folks because they don't look like you, uh, or talk like you, uh, or walk like you, uh, or dress like you, uh, or go to church like you, uh, or got a job like you, uh, or smell like you, I got hair like you. I got shoes like you. I talk like you. Stop judging, folks. It's so funny to me that we as Christians are not supposed to be judgmental. But sometimes Christians are some of the most judgmental folks that you can come across. But what I realize is those are not Christians. They're are the church folks. And that's a difference between Christians and church folks. When you turn folks away because they don't match up to your standard, you might just be blocking your own blessing. You don't know who God has in place to bless you. So we go on to verse 3. Verse 3 says that Paul gathered some sticks and he threw them on the fire and a snake was driven out by the heat and it fastened itself to his hand. The snake didn't just strike and keep moving. The word says that it fastened itself. I mean, it attached itself to Paul and it wouldn't let go. But let's look at what Paul did not do. When this snake attached itself to Paul, Paul did not just stand there with a snake attached to his hand with the poison just shooting through his vein. He did not stand there and say, hey, everybody, look. There's a snake attached to my hand, uh, belly aching about how bad uh, this snake is hurting my hand. He didn't take a selfie uh, and put it on Facebook and say, look, y'all, I got a snake attached uh, to my hand. Instead, he took action to remove this creature from himself. Listen, when the enemy attacks, sometimes uh, he strikes and keeps coming, keep going, and then there are other times when he attacks uh, and he hangs on, uh, pumping venom into your life, uh, trying to kill you, uh, trying to kill your hopes and your, your dreams and their desires, uh, trying to kill your faith in God. Uh, can, I be, can, I, can I be transparent for a moment? Uh, the last 10 to 11 months of my life have been real crazy, y'all. I'm talking real crazy. I've had attack after attack after attack, uh, attacks on my body, 
uh, attacks on my finances, uh, attacks on my family. And it seemed as if every time I was about to catch my breath uh, and find a little bit of peace, then another attack, attack came and I latched on to me. Uh, and it got to the point, i uh, tell you what, I was then beginning to have uh, some attacks on my mind because I'm like, God, I don't understand why these things keep happening to me one after another, after another, after another. Do I not live right? Do I not go to church? Do I not praise you? Do I not worship you? Do I not let you use me? Do I not give the way I'm supposed to give? And so it kept happening. Like, God, what's going on? But then I reminded the Bible says, should I accept the good, only the good, and not the bad? And so I had to, I had to determine, am I going to just sit here uh, and let these attacks uh, stay latched to me, or am I going to pull myself together, remind myself who I am, remind myself whose I am, remind myself who he is, and then keep on moving? And so I had to take some actions uh, to get myself uh, to a better place. And so whenever you are attacked, you've got to, to make a decision uh, as to whether you are going to just stand there uh, and let him hang on or are you going to shake him off. Uh, you have to attack uh, your attacks uh, with the same vengeance that they attack you. Attack your attacks with the same vengeance that they attack you. Paul had to become violent and aggressive toward this, this serpent to get him off of himself. There are some things that will come into our lives that sometimes we can just pray and ask God to take away. And then there are those things that you have to be aggressive with in the kingdom to get them to move from your life. Sometimes you can't just pray. Sometimes you got to fast and pray. Sometimes you got to go down on your face before the Lord. Sometimes you got to declare spiritual warfare to shake it loose. You got to shake it like your life depends on it. Shake loose that spirit of depression. Shake loose that spirit of addiction. Shake loose that spirit of hopelessness and suicide. Shake loose that spirit of poverty and lack. Dorothy Norwood sang a song. She said, shake, shake, shake. Shake the devil off. In the name of Jesus, shake the devil off. That's old school, Deacon Harden there. They, they don't know nothing about that Dorothy Norwood. This generation like Jonathan Reynolds and, and Travis Green, they don't know nothing about Dorothy Norwood and Shirley Caesar and the gospel caravan, amen. And don't get me wrong, I like Jonathan Reynolds and Travis Green, but, but sometimes you got to go back to the stuff that you were raised on. Sometimes you got to go back to the stuff that made mama shout, amen. But whatever it is, you've got to take action to save yourself. And so now verse 4 goes on to say, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. As soon as Paul was bitten by the snake, those people who, who knew nothing about him assumed that he had done something wrong. People are so quick to accuse, to criticize, and to make assumptions when they cannot comprehend what they see or what they hear or better what better yet based on what they think should happen they are quick to jump to conclusions based on wrong information or their own limited thinking some of you know what I'm talking about folks have developed opinions of you solely based on what they think they know about you or what they've heard about you and they got a whole narrative created in their head without knowing a thing about you these people knew nothing about Paul, yet when they saw him being attacked, they accused him of doing uh, something wrong. Sometimes uh, we can just be trying our best, trying to do good, as Paul would say, and we are attacked, uh, criticized, misunderstood, uh, and falsely accused. Uh, but when you know who
who you are and you know whose you are, you don't have to worry about what the folks have to say about you. As long as you and God know the truth, then that's all that really matters. And if you keep on doing what you're supposed to do and let God be God, he'll take care of you and handle the folks at the same time. I learned a long time ago that God can handle folks better than I can. Every battle that I come across ain't mine to fight. Every wrong that's done against me ain't mine to right. If I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battles, I know that the victory shall be mine. So you just got to learn how time and time time to take your hands off. You ain't got to respond to everything that's said to you. You ain't got to respond to everything that's said about you. Let God handle it. And trust me, God will. Here's what I learned, too, is that God said you might not ever see it being handled, but just know it will be handled because everything is for our eyes. Amen. So Paul built the fire. He put wood on the fire to build it up to make the fire stronger and hotter. And if you didn't know, snakes are cold-blooded animals, meaning that they cannot generate uh, internal heat, uh, and so they rely on heat uh, from external sources. Uh, so the heat from the fire that Paul built up uh, probably drew the snake out. Uh, can I tell you this? Uh, Whenever you burn with the fire of God, uh, it's going to draw out some snakes. Uh, it's going to draw out some tax uh, against you. Uh, why? It's because the snakes uh, can sense the heat. Uh, and the more you pray uh, and the more you read God's word and the more you apply God's word, uh, the more you begin to live right, uh, the more you are building the fire of God within you. Listen, Satan uh, is not going to bother you uh, if you are cold for God because uh, he's cold bloody himself. Uh, and he said, if I don't, if I already got you, uh, then I don't need nothing for you. Uh, but when he figure out uh, that you are on fire for God, uh, he's trying to plot attack uh, to your life. Uh, but as soon as you turn up the heat, uh, trust and believe uh, that the snakes will come out. Uh, but what did Paul do uh, when that snake came out uh, and attached itself to him? Uh, you got to do uh, just what Paul did in verse 5. He said he shook the snake snake off and not that he just not only did he just shake the snake off he shook the snake off into the fire and so the snake represents your attacks and the fire represents the power of God so anything that comes against you to attach itself to you you just gotta shake 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 it into the fire God will have me to tell you this morning that the devil has sent some things uh, to try and destroy you, uh, but it's not going to kill you uh, because you're in here this morning uh, turning up the heat. Uh, I want you to tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, uh, excuse me, uh, but I've got to turn up uh, my thermostat. Uh, you might want to move out the way uh, because this next praise uh, is going to be hot. Uh, I'm getting ready uh, to praise like I've never praised before. Uh, I don't have time to try and be cute because I'm praising for my life. I'm praising for my destiny. I'm praising for my family. I'm praising for my children. I'm praising for my health. And when I finish this next praise, every attack, every snake that's been sent against me will be shut loose into the fire of God. And now would you take about 30 seconds and praise God uh, to build up a fire uh, that will consume uh, attack uh, on your life. Verse 6 says, we almost out of here. Verse 6 says, the snake bit Paul, and the people were expecting him to sweat up, swell up, and certainly and suddenly die. Wasn't it was not enough that they had already falsely accused him, but now they're waiting 
for his death. And because it didn't happen right away, the Bible says they waited for a long time. This man that they had never seen before, they waited for him to die. And the reason they waited for him to die is because they've seen it happen before. They've seen this snake bite somebody and the person swell up and die. See, oftentimes, people will plant a negative seed in your life and then they wait for it to grow like weeds and check you, take you out and take your life. And they do this because they've seen it before. They've done it to other people before. And they think because they do it to you, the same thing is going to happen. But because they've seen it before, and they've seen it win before, God says that that does not mean it's going to happen to you. God says that you, beloved, are the exception. Medical science says you should have died. Every natural circumstance says you shouldn't have made it, that you should have been killed, that you should be at a mental institution, strung out on drugs, mad at God, or mad at the world. But I came by today to tell somebody that God said, not only are you going to make it, but when you make it, you won't even look like what you've been through. I'm reminded of when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, God didn't just part the waters, but he made sure that they had dry ground to walk on. So when they reached the other side, they didn't even have mud between their toes. It looked like the enemy was closing in on them. But they just kept on uh, walking. Uh, and while they were walking, uh, God was taking care uh, of their enemies. Uh, they were walking uh, and their enemies were drowning. Uh, and so I want to tell somebody today uh, that God said, uh, you just keep on walking. Uh, it doesn't matter what they said about you. Uh, you keep on walking. Uh, it doesn't matter what they did to you. Uh, you just keep on walking. Uh, this is not the place to sit down, uh, to stop and to cry. Uh, God says, uh, just keep on walking. Uh, and when you get to the other side, uh, you won't even look like uh, what you've been through. Uh, you may have waded the water uh, and treaded through the mud. Uh, but when God delivers you uh, on the inside, uh, you won't even have mud uh, on your shoes. And so, the snake bit Paul. And after waiting a long time, Nothing happened. So then the people changed their mind and said, well, he must be a God. They went from one extreme to another. They went from calling him a murderer to declaring he was a God. But what they did not know is that they were, they were soon to find out that Paul was not a God, but he served under the authority of the God. Listen, I know what it feels like to be shipwrecked. And I know what it feels like to be bitten by the serpent. But I also know what it feels like uh, to shake the snake off uh, into the fire. <laughs> Somebody listening to me right now, uh, and you know what you've been through. Uh, you know everything that you've been through. Uh, everybody else said it would have killed you. Uh, you know if the devil had his way, uh, you would have been dead uh, a long time ago. Uh, you know if some people had their way, uh, then carried out their good intentions, uh, you'd be somewhere locked up. Uh, but I want to tell you today uh, that God says uh, that you will survive it. Uh, and so today, uh, I want somebody to declare out of their own mouth uh, that I am still, uh, I'm still here. Uh, I'm still here because uh, God has a plan uh, for my life. Uh, I'm still here because uh, I have a destiny uh, to fulfill. Somebody uh, ought to lift your hands uh, right now and say, uh, I will survive this. Uh, I may be broken, uh, but I will 
will survive this. I may be wounded, but I will survive this. I may be crying, but I will survive this. I may be confused and rejected, but I will survive this. I know I'm not everything I should be. I'm still struggling with some stuff right now. I still slip up every now and then. I say some things I shouldn't say. I do some things I shouldn't do. I go some places I shouldn't go. And I know I'm not where I should be by now, but I know that I'm moving in the right direction. Right now, you ought to give God some glory and thank God that you made it through the storm. The storm should have killed you, but you survived it. The storm should have taken your life, but you survived it. Some things were your own fault, but you survived it. Some things you brought unto yourself, but you survived it. But God had mercy on you, and you survived it. God had grace on you, and you survived it. You are the shout out to God right now. God, I thank you, God, that I'm still here, and I thank you, God, that I survived it. God says you will survive it. In spite of what it looks like, in spite of what it sounds like, God says that you will survive it. And again I say, how do you know that you will survive it? Because you've survived it before. No one in this place, no one watching us online has never had a trial or a tribulation in your life. We've all had them. And if you have not had one, then I'll say like my mama say, just keep on living because it's on the way. But the fact that you are alive here today with breath in your body, clothes in your right mind, is evidence that you survived it. And if you just uh, survived it before, you can and you will survive it again. God does not change. You and I, we change. God doesn't change. But the wonderful news is that in the midst, in the midst of our changing and not being consistent, God still looks out. God still takes care of us. Because he made a promise that he would never leave us or forsake us. And like I said before, God is not a man that he should lie. And so you hold on to your faith. You hold on to your fight. And every attack that's sent your way, you shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off into the fire. Because when you shake it off to the fire, that says God I'm giving it to you. And God, when I give it to you, I want you to destroy it. I want you to, to do what you can do with it. That it may never come my way again. And also to realize there are some things that we are going to go through that's God ordained and God allowed. And so you already know you're going to survive those things because God will never take you to a thing or through a thing that he won't go to with you or that he won't go through with you. So I just want to encourage you today that no matter where you find yourself, just know that you will survive it. Amen. Come on, give God some glory this morning. Amen. Listen, I'm going to um, ask everybody to stand. Everybody, please stand. <clears throat> there may be one here on today or someone who's watching today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And so what you're saying is, you know what, um, I can shake it, I can shake it loose, but I don't have the fire inside of me to shake it to the fire. That fire's name is Jesus Christ. So if you're watching today, if you're in this place called Sanctuary today, and you've not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I invite you to come down now. That's the first call, second call is... You may have already accepted Christ, but somewhere along the way, your fire has started to dim. And you need 
and to reconnect with the body of Christ called the church and you want to make this your church home, I invite you to come in now. So if you want to rededicate yourself, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you want to make this your church home, come on, give God some glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God some glory. Amen. 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 It's not too late. If there's another who you would like to make this your church home, if you want to dedicate your life to Christ, if you want to rededicate yourself, I invite you to come down now. Is there another? Amen. Come on. Give God some glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Is there another? Is there another? Come on, rejoice. Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Hallelujah. Is there another? Hallelujah. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. Is there another? Amen. 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 I'm, I'm so, I'm so encouraged because these are young folks. Amen. These are young folks. It lets us know a couple of things. It lets us know that God still speaks to the heart of young people. Amen. But it also lets us know that our team ministry, amen, is doing something right. Amen. That all we have to do is plant the seed, amen, and let God do the watering, amen, that we will see the result. Listen, is there another? Is there another? Listen, before you young ladies go to the back, these five folks are going to take you to the back and get some information from you and let you know what your next steps for you. I, I just want to pray for you, amen. I just want to pray for you. Everybody, if you will, bow your hands in prayer. And those of you who know the power of prayer, reach your hand towards these young ladies, those who are standing by. If you would, put your hands on these young ladies as we go to God in prayer. God, we thank you. God, we praise you, Father God, for what you are doing right now, Father God. We rejoice in the fact, Father God, that these young ladies heard your voice, oh God, and made the decision to take the step, Father God, to get even closer to you, Father God. God, we're rejoicing because we know that you still speak to the hearts and to the minds and to the souls of young folks. Oh God, we are rejoicing because we see the evidence of the seeds that we're planting right here in this church, oh God, to produce fruit such as this, Father God. But now, Father God, right now, we pray a hedge of protection, Father God, over these young ladies, Father God. Because, God, we know that as much as we in heaven are rejoicing, Father God, the devil is real mad right now, oh God. Because today he lost three souls that he thought he had a chance with, Father God. But, God, we thank you that as long as you sit high and look low, Father God, that you still have power and control of the things here on earth, Father God. So, God, we pray that you will look into their lives. Father God, and see everything that they stand in need of, Father God. And God, because you are Jehovah Jireh, oh God, we pray that you will start to provide even now, Father God. Work upon their hearts, Father God, to see that they may have callings upon their life, Father God, to do great things, Father God, to continue to win souls for the kingdom, Father God. Let each and every one of them, Father God, touch someone in a way, Father God, that by next week, Father God, we'll have three more, Father God, and three more the week after that, Father God, and three more the week after that, Father God, because God, we know that you can do the multiplying through us, oh God. And so right now, God, we give you praise, oh God. Right now, we say thank you, God, for the wonderful things you've done today, Father God. We thank you, God, for what our eyes have seen, oh God, our ears and heart but heard, Father God. But most of all, God, we thank you for what our hearts have experienced by these three souls who have come to unite with your church, Father God. God, we give you all the honor, glory, and praise, and this we pray in your son Jesus' name. Everybody here say amen, amen, amen. Amen. Listen. These fine folks are going to take you to the back, get some information from you, and let you know what next steps are for your membership. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God some glory. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. It's giving time. It's giving time. It's giving time. Amen. Y'all don't sound excited to give. I said it's giving time. Amen. You ought to be excited that you have something to give. 
Had God not put the seed in your hand, you wouldn't have anything to give. So anytime you have a chance to give, there should be a level of excitement. So one time, one more time, I'm going to say, it's giving time. Was slightly better, so we'll take it. Amen. Amen. So you have, we have our different ways to give. Uh, you can give online using Push Pay. You can give um, using Cash App. You can go to our website to give, or you can bring your offerings down forth at this time. Just please remember your weekly vision building campaign commitment that you have made. We ask that you be consistent in your what you pledge to do, because those funds have been calculated for a purpose. Being projected based on what you committed to do, amen. So let's make sure that you committed to that. So if all hearts and minds are ready, you may now come and give. Father God, we pray it be multiplied and used for the building of your kingdom. God, we thank you in your word that you said you would give seed to us with a sword, Father God. So God, we pray a hundredfold, two hundredfold, three hundredfold back to those who have sown seed, Father God, for Father that God they gave for good intentions. And God, we're upon the seed that we receive jobs and better jobs, houses and bonuses, sorry, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. I don't have um, any big news announcements, just a couple of reminders um, that we are taking a break from life groups until the month of July, so we will resume those um, in the month of August. In the month of August, we have our annual Soul for School um, campaign that's going on that we are wrapping up next Sunday, so please, um, for those of you who are team leaders and those who have committed to be a part of the team, make sure that you are actively working to raise the funds that we are asking to raise and we're going to do our event I think it's July 30th on a Sunday right here at church so make sure you get those funds in we're trying to have that all wrapped up um, by next Sunday listen if you did not get a chance to go by the peach cobble factory last week doing the soft the opening or yesterday doing the grand opening or any time in between Make sure that you get there as soon as possible. I think they're open on Sundays, I believe, so you can go by today and get you a, a nice treat. If any of you and my friends on Facebook can see, I had my strapped in to my front seat in my cup because I want to make sure I ain't lose nothing. Amen. So we want to, number one, enjoy a good treat, but number one, we want to be a support and a blessing to our pastor, his family, who are the owners of this establishment. Amen. Amen. Um, if we have any visitors here that's worshiping with us this morning, um, we welcome you. We're not going to ask you to stand and say your name and stuff like that, but we would like to share just a moment with you to love on you and to greet you and let you know that we're so happy to have you worship with us. Sister Veronica, right here in the white shirt, raise your hand, Sister Veronica. She will meet you on the other side back in the fellowship hall. So once we are dismissed, you can grab your things and make your way over there. And we just want to spend a few minutes to... Um, to welcome you and love on you and let you know how glad we are that you chose to worship here at New Destiny this morning. Amen. Amen. So if all hearts and minds are Oh, one last thing. I'm going to ask everyone to please um, keep Reverend Corey Jonner and his family in prayer. Um, his father transitioned late last night. I mean, he shared a lot of us about the journey his father's been going through. And so his father went home to glory last night. So please keep Reverend Jonner and his family in your prayers. Amen. If all hearts and minds agree, if we would please stand. And do me a favor. Tell the person next to you, say, I love you. Just in case no one else has said it to you today, I love you. Amen. 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 Let's pray. God, we thank you. God, we praise you. God, we thank you for everything we've experienced on today, Father God. 
We thank you, God, that we have been reassured and reaffirmed that no matter what we're going through, Father God, the trials and the tribulations, the attacks that try to destroy our lives, Father God, we know, Father God, that we will survive it, Father God. We know we will survive it, God, because you've done it before. You're no respecter of person, God, and you remain the same, and you never change, oh God. And because you've done it before, Father God, we know that you will do it again, Father God. And so, God, as we depart from this place, but never from your presence, Father God, let us go on forward, Father God, having been better for being here, Father God. And that when we return home today, Father God, that we won't find things the way we left them, Father God. That we will find them just a little bit better, oh God, because we are better for having been in your presence. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We give you honor, glory, and praise in this. We pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.